Welcome to today's class. Um, last time we stopped here in our discussion of investment banking and we'll continue today with a, a short discussion of how investment banks help oh no not this again uh, how investment banks help with um, yeah um, how they help clients um, generate capital, uh, take up capital, both debt and equity. Uh, we have talked a little bit about IPOs. We'll continue this today. Um, and um, we'll discuss some alternative methods of issuing new equity because uh, these methods differ by the way investment banks are involved as underwriters. So. Um, First of all, it's important to note that uh, you can distinguish and differentiate between two types uh, of equity sales. The first one is an IPO, an initial public offering, or a so-called unseasoned equity offering. That means that this is the very first time that you, as a company, go public. Um, you issue shares to the public, and as part of an IPO, the investors uh, are able to buy shares of this company for the very first time. In addition to an IPO, we also have so-called seasoned offerings, which mean that at some point in time, the company decides to increase its equity capital, capital basis. It requires new equity and it sells additional shares in addition to the ones it has already sold as part of the IPO. And this is a seasoned offering. In German, um, the distinction is quite clear uh, because in German we say Börsengang, that's the initial public offering, and Kapitalerhöhung, so the uh, increment in equity, uh, if you were to translate it uh, word by word, Kapitalerhöhung, uh, that's the word for a seasoned offering. And it shows you that at some point in time, the company requires additional equity and it raises equity and it raises capital by offering new shares as part of a seasoned offering. Now, um, the company can also decide to offer those shares to the general public or in a what we call a private placement or private placing. Now, you have to be careful um, with the distinction between a corporation and a private corporation and a public corporation, it could be that you are in the legal that your company has the legal entity of a corporation, and that you are sh that you have shares in the form of stocks, but it could be that these stocks are not publicly traded on an exchange, but they are private. The same in German. In German, as you might know, um, a stock company is an Aktiengesellschaft. Uh, and the shares and the stocks of a stock corporation, of a stock company, do not necessarily need to be traded on a stock exchange. They can just be in the property, in the possession of a few number of private persons. Then you have a private company. So if you issue new securities, new shares, it could be that you offer those shares to the general public, then you have a public uh, placement, a public issue. Or you hand select a few private equity investors. That's why they're called private equity investors, because they will give you private equity, and it's in contrast to public equity. And you have a so-called private placement. It depends on what you're interested in. If you want a broad spectrum of investors uh, and a huge number of small investors, then of course you will have a public issue. Uh, but if the amount of capital you want to raise is rather low and if you know the handful of investors who are willing to step in as private equity investors, you can also do a private placement. Now, there are two different types of public issues. First, a general takeover offer um, within such a so-called cash offer. The equity capital is sold to all interested investors. Um, the IPO or unseasoned new issue is the prime example for this. This is the first public issue of a company. 
or you can uh, issue rights. In a rights issue, equity capital is sold to already invested shareholders as part of, for example, a seasoned offering or a seasoned new issue, which is a new offer after a previous IPO with the company securities having already been issued before. Uh, this is a little bit more tricky than it's explained here on the slide. Um, if you, um, some of you might have taken my class in, uh, uh, in the introduction to business. I explained this a little bit in the introduction to business. In a stock company, uh, obviously, uh, one of the main rights you have as a shareholder is the right and um, the right to preferential treatment when it comes to a seasoned offering. If the management of a stock company decides to raise capital, this would mean that your shares are diluted. You still own, say, let's make a small, small example. Let's assume we have a stock company with 100 shares. Each and every one of us owns 10 shares. If management decides to raise capital by issuing another 100 shares, suddenly your share in the company will drop from 10 to 5%. Simple math. In order to prevent this delusion, um, you as a previous shareholder get preferential treatment when it gets to a seasoned offering. So you have the right to first come and first get served when it comes to a new offered shares. And this is a rights issue. You will be issued the right to buy new shares. German, the same thing. In der Kapitalerhöhung haben Sie als Altaktionär das Recht, uh, zuerst auf die neuen Aktien zuzugreifen, damit Sie verhindern können, dass Ihr prozentualer Anteil am Unternehmen uh, verwässert wird. Das ist das Wort uh, Verwässerung im Deutschen, im Englischen ist Dilution. Diluted. Okay. Now what happens in a public issue? Um, first of all, as part of an IPO, um, you as a company and management will write a so-called Pathfinder Prospectus. That's the first preliminary prospectus that presents the proposed offer. That will be done a few months before the offer. Then you will have pre-underwriting conferences. Um, you will get a first feeling of how much money you need and how much money investors, are, the main institutional investors, are in principle willing to invest in your company. You will get first offers, first expressions of interest, and uh, you will be able to determine a band with, within which the price, the, the final price in the IPO uh, will vary in. Uh, and you will need to determine an underwriter and uh, a consulting investment bank. This will be done, for example, four months before the, uh, before the prospectus is issued. Then you'll have the complete prospectus um, that will include all relevant financial uh, and uh, um, entrepreneurial information. Um, depending on the legal system you're operating in, it will usually be so that um, management will be liable for any errors in the prospectus. So if uh, the um, numbers, if the um, accounting figures in the prospectus are wrong, um, you will be liable. Um, in German, that's, uh, we have a very nice name for that that immediately makes clear what is meant, prospekthaftung. So you, you have a liability if the prospectus is wrong um, because this is an attempt to defraud investors. And in German, that's, uh, we have a statute uh, in our criminal code against that. That's prospekthaftung. Okay. And public issuance and sale um, in a very typical so-called firm commitment agreement between the investment bank and the company. Uh, the underwriter, that is the investment bank, uh, buys a predefined amount of equity capital and it will try to sell it at a higher price. And if you have more than one investment bank, you will have a syndicate and the underwriting syndicate of investment banks will help with the sale. Shortly, 
after the last day of the registration period. And then finally, after the final price has been fixed, the stocks have been issued, you will have a phase of market stabilization in which the underwriter stands ready to place orders to stabilize the price. Usually meaning it will buy up stocks in case the stock price goes down. So you can, you can see from all these um, uh, steps in a public issue where an investment bank will help a client. First of all, you need expertise when it comes to finding institutional investors. You will need professional help when it comes to writing the prospectus, getting together and, and fulfilling the requirements uh, to even contact the stock exchange, um, to even uh, change the legal entity of your company. Um, the investment banks will know the institutional investors. Then the investment bank will help you with the prospectus, um, with the um, conferences, the so-called roadshow. It will get you uh, in contact with the large institutional investors and it will help you and advise you on the final stock price, uh, which you can fix, obviously. Uh, it will run the books for you, um, the order book. And most importantly, uh, the investment bank will help you sell the stocks. You will usually will not just drop all stocks on the market, but you will distribute them according to your order book. Um, and then the investment bank will also buy up a certain number of shares. It will guarantee in a contract that they will not immediately sell all those shares, but they will keep the shares for a period of time, hoping that they will make a profit out of it. And it might be that as part of their contractual agreement that the underwriter also stands ready to stabilize the market in case the stock price goes down. Yeah? So that's the risk in return here. Obviously, the underwriter has the risk that it needs to buy up shares that will go down, but it will also have the opportunity to sell shares if the stock prices go up and if the IPO has been successful. By the way, um, probably one of the more famous uh, examples of a botched IPO from the recent history is the one by um, Facebook. Yeah. If you look, it has already been, I guess, probably almost 10 years now, but um, the investment banks, I think it was Goldman Sachs, um, that um, helped uh, Facebook with their IPO, did a pretty bad job, and on the first day of trading, the Facebook uh, stock plummeted immediately and they had to stabilize the market afterwards. And they lost a lot of money on that day. Okay. That's a public issue. Then we also have takeover offers and firm commitments. So what happens in a firm commitment? The company negotiates an agreement with a bank, investment bank, to secure and market the new shares. A fixed number of shares are bought by the underwriter and sold at a higher price. The investment bank acts as an underwriter as it accepts the risk of not being able to further sell the securities. So that's the risk for the investment bank, that it will simply be left with stocks that are not worth too much. And in order to minimize the risk, usually banks will probably not merge, you should put that in brackets. Uh, they will form a temporary alliance and such a temporary alliance is called a syndicate here. They will use a syndicate. Several banks will cooperate uh, on this project and they will uh, form a so-called underwriting syndicate. And the spread or the discount, which is the difference between the purchase price of the underwriter and the offer price, then is the syndicate fee. Now, you can see here that there is a conflict of interest uh, in an IPO uh, when it comes to the syndicate fee. Why? Where, where does the, um, the obvious conflict of interest between the investment bank and the uh, company going public lies? What's the conflict of interest here? Imagine, 
you were an investment bank and you wanted to help me in my IPO. The stock is worth 20 euros. But we don't know that yet. We only have an, a faint idea of what the price, the fair price should look like. I have even less information than you. You are a professional investment bank. You should know how markets think. So what should you tell me? Yeah? Yeah. Now let's assume the investment bank tells me I should sell at 30. What will happen? I will sell my shares at 30 and I will also sell my shares at 30 euros per share to the investment bank. On the first day of trading, the stock will go down. Is that good or bad for the investment bank? Bad. Yeah. So the investment bank has um, obvious um, incentive to go for a lower price. Now, I know the fair price is $20. Ex pause. So in this scenario, the price will go up to 20 euros after the IPO on the first day of trading. And I, as a company, I will see that I have 1 million shares. I sold them for 10 euros. I got 10 million euros in equity. And I could have gotten 20 million. So I've wasted capital. I would have been able to raise 20 million. I only raised 10 million. And the investment bank now takes in, obviously, uh, a large profit. They will probably not have bought all, mil all of the 1 million shares, but they will make a profit. And this is the, the syndicate fee, obviously. This is the, uh, the fee I have to pay in addition to other fees to the investment bank. But if this were the case, why do you think do investment banks nevertheless try to find the right price, the fair price of the stock? I have asymmetric information. I am at a worse position than the investment bank, and the investment bank could also go for uh, five euros. But why would the investment bank probably not do this? and try to fix the price at 20 euros. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. Um, if the investment bank does this once, other market participants will notice, like in the case of Facebook, they will see that the investment bank did a pretty bad job, and they will probably not get a second or third chance to do this at different companies. So the reputational effects will be detrimental to the investment bank and they will not be able to get new clients. So they will be well advised to find the fair price uh, in the IPO. However, there is a tendency to, for investment banks to fix it slightly under the fair price. Why? First of all, investment banks will try to get a slight premium out of this. They will try to get a syndicate fee. And if the price is 18 euros, on the first day of trading, the stock price will go up. If it were 22, it would go down slightly. And it is always good to have a slightly increasing or an, in general, an increasing stock price on the first day of trading. So companies will try, companies together with investment banks will usually accept a small premium and this premium is called underpricing. This is, there's a, there's a, 
Um, this is a fixed term in, in uh, finance. This is what we call underpricing. Yeah? If you set a price that is slightly lower than the fair price in the IPO, yeah? and there are huge um, studies on underpricing in IPOs. Now, this is the firm commitment approach. This is a contract in which the investment banks um, agrees on buying up shares and selling them on their own account later mm -hmm. in a best effort uh, contract. The underwriter acts as an agent and receives a commission for each share sold. But in contrast to the firm commitment, the underwriter does not buy the shares and therefore the underwriter, aka the investment bank, bears no risk. And there is no guarantee how much money will be raised. The difference between the two is, again, coming back to my example of 1 million shares, in a firm commitment contract, the investment bank will buy up all of the 1 million shares, and then it's the responsibility and the risk of the investment banks to get the shares sold at a good price. In a best effort contract, the investment bank will only market the shares, and it will get a small commission for each share it can sell. But if the investment bank only sells 200,000 of the 1 million shares, well, then only 200,000 shares are sold and the company raises much less capital. So that's the difference. You can also do a Dutch auction in which the underwriter does not set a fixed price for the shares to be sold, but conducts an auction in which investors bid for the shares and the bid price is determined by the bids placed. The company determines the highest bid price for a certain number of shares. That is also done in many large public IPOs, for example, Telecom and Facebook, where you can see that uh, you, you will get a price range in the prospectus. They will tell you that the final price will be somewhere between 30 and 40 euros. You don't know the exact price, and then you can make a bid. And the investment bank will gather all those bids, and then it will allocate the shares that are available to the highest bidder, and it will fix a price within the range. Kennt man auch aus dem Deutschen so schön, wenn es heißt, eine Aktie ist dreifach überzeichnet. Sie zeichnen dann Aktien, sie geben Gebote ab ähm, in einer Preisspanne und dann heißt es irgendwann, der finale Preis, der festgelegt worden ist, ist 35 Euro äh, und sie wollten eigentlich 100 Aktien haben, kriegen aber nur 23 oder ähnliches ja, zu dem Preis. Okay. Firm Commitment Underwriting is more widely used for larger issues than best effort underwriting. Smaller emissions primarily use best efforts due to the greater uncertainty. That is quite clear. If you're a small company, you can expect investment banks to go all in and buy all shares in a firm commitment contract. They will only accept a best efforts contract. If you are Facebook, if you are the hottest IPO in the last decade, investment banks will do anything for you and they will definitely give you a firm contract, a firm commitment contract. For an offer of a certain size, the cost of best effort underwriting and firm commitment underwriting are the same. And some underwriting contracts um, also contain a so-called green shoe provision. Uh, I think green shoe comes from the name of the company in which, uh, of which in the IPO it was use first. So the green shoe provision um, gives the investment bank the option to acquire further shares at the offer price after the IPO, meaning that the investment bank gets the option to make an additional profit in case the share price has increased. And the green shoe provision gives the investment bank another incentive to make a good IPO, to support the IPO and make the IPO successful. And the reason for this green shoe option is to cover excess demand and oversubscriptions 
and it can be included in an IPO. Obviously, it's a benefit for the underwriting syndicate. It's an option. The minimum value of the option is obviously zero. So it has a, pos a net positive or non-negative um, return to the um, underwriting syndicate. And it's an additional cost for the issuer. Because um, when do you think the syndicate will exercise this option? Only if the current market price is higher than the exercise price uh, in the green shoot provision, meaning that additional shares are marketed for a price that is lower than the current market price. And the period after a new security has been sold to the public for the first time is called the aftermarket. And as I told you before, investment banks also support their clients in the aftermarket by stabilizing the market in case the price plummets. Okay. I think I've um, talked enough about the different functions investment banks have in an IPO. They support their clients by doing research, by doing a company valuation, due diligence, by providing advice, access to institutional investors, uh, marketing securities, acting as an underwriter. The banks sometimes bear the respons responsibility of fair pricing and marketing. And um, when a company goes public for the first time, buyers have relatively little information about the company's operations and therefore have to rely on the judgment of investment banks and the choice and the acceptance by well-known investment banks usually also sends a signal of quality to investors that if, for example, Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan are uh, accepting this client uh, and helping this client uh, to go public, that this is a company of quality. And investment banks thus have a self-interest in pursuing fair pricing and avoiding unethical transactions, in theory, obviously. Okay. Now, how do you select uh, a suitable investment bank? Uh, you can do a competitive offer or you can do a negotiated offer. The difference is just if you're a large company uh, like Facebook, uh, you will probably have a competitive bidding of investment banks to um, uh, support you in your IPO. If you're a small, unknown company, you will be lucky to get a negotiated offer. So obviously, because investment banks know that a mandate for a large IPO is a huge cash cow, it's quite natural that investment banks will fight with each other to get these mandates and these clients. The price of the offer. I don't want to go into too much detail here because the price of the offer, um, this could also be part of a whole lecture on asset pricing. Um, what should the stock price look like? What you would do is, uh, you can take a look um, on the next couple of slides. Um, you can either do a valuation by uh, and through comparables. Um, you can take the market to book ratio, you can take the earnings price ratio, and you can compare uh, the fundamental accounting data from this company with comparable peer group competitors. For example, if you see that the price earnings ratio of, well, let's make a good example. If you have, if you were to price the new share and to do a valuation and due diligence for a competitor of Tesla. What would you do? You would take the market to book ratio, you would take the price earnings ratio of Tesla and compare those with the stock price and then compare it with the financial ratios of your company for which you want to price the stock. This is what valuations through comparables is. Um, you can also do valuations through comparison um, and the market to books or book to market ratio and the price earnings ratio already tells you something about um, how the um, market values these companies. Obviously, this can only be done um, after the IPO. And here, for example, are some uh, ratios for some selected companies. And you can see that there are some cases where you have uh, seasoned industries 
uh, like PepsiCo, Campbell Soup, Walmart, where you can see that the company ratios are actually close to the ones of the competitors. Uh, whereas here, Amazon obviously has completely different ratios than its competitors. So in some cases, it makes sense to make a comparison with competitors. In some cases, it doesn't make too much sense. For example, for companies that are quite unique, Apple, Amazon, Google, Tesla, um, it doesn't make too much sense to compare those to its main competitors, who are the main competitors of Tesla. Now here, um, I just want to des describe to you some very basic notions of how to price a share and how to price a stock. Again, this could be a part of a whole lecture series on asset pricing. If you are interested in this, and if you're interested in this in more detail, I would strongly advise you to look up the uh, textbook and also the YouTube videos of John Cochrane formerly at the University of Chicago. Uh, I think he's now in a th at a think tank in California. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's well known for his great textbook on asset pricing, uh, and he has uh, very good um, lecture videos on YouTube on asset pricing. Now, the basic idea in asset pricing is just you have a stream of cash flows, um, and these cash flows um, have a present value, and in a very simple, in a very simple world uh, with a capital, perfect capital market, obviously the price of such an instrument, of such an investment, should be equal to the net present value of um, of the present value of the future cash flows. Now, in the case of a stock, uh, if you buy the stock for P zero. Uh, what will you get in the future? A dividend payment, let's call it Div 1, uh, and you will pay out um, P0, and if you sell the stock after one period, you will get the dividend and the price at T1, so you will have Div 1 plus P1, and if you're interested in the return, minus P0 divided by P0. That's a simple return of this investment. Um, and in asset pricing, it's basically the same. You have cash flows, and you uh, have prices that are equal to the net present value of those cash flows. And it's, it gets complicated when you have interest rates. Right? Now, on the other hand, if you simply turn it around, you can see that what should the price look like. P1, future price of the stock, plus the dividend divided by 1 plus R, meaning that uh, you take the return um, of an alternative if the market is arbitrage-free. Let's assume this is the risk-free rate. Um, so if you discount the future payments by 1 plus the risk-free rate, this should be the arbitrage-free price of this stock in a very, very simplified um, way of expressing this. Mm -hmm. This discount rate is the cost of equity capital, or the market capitalization rate. And the question now is what determines, if you know the price, obviously, then this is the return. Uh, now, what determines next year's price? If you apply this price formula, you will get P1 equals to div 2 plus P actually 3 over 1 plus r and and oh no actually this is true no it's not it's p2 it was already one period um add so that's p1 and you can continue doing this and what you see is that if you substitute all this, you can forecast P1 by forecasting Div2 and so on. And in the end, you will see that the price today should be equal to the first dividend plus the second dividend plus the second price over 1 plus R squared 
we can then again proceed and so on and so on and in the end you will see that what happens is the price should be equal to the price at your investment horizon in the very end and all dividend payments in between not very surprising you will simply keep the stock until say eternity and you will get dividend payments up until then now if h your investment horizon approaches infinity this here will go to zero meaning we can simply neglect this and in the end uh, the net present value or the present value the fair price of the stock should be what the sum of the discount of future payments which in this case are the dividend payments so only the dividend payments are of interest to us and this should be the price hence the share value is equal to the discounted stream of dividends this is a discounted cash flow formula for the stock price in theory um, and the DCF formula for the present value of a stock is the same as for any other asset because we just discount the cash flows by the opportunity cost of capital um, this formula was derived under the assumption that the price in any period is determined by expected dividends and capital gains over the next period and this means that the share value is just the present value of the expected future dividends okay now this is one idea you can also do the same with free cash flows if we do not have dividends but we can also use the free cash flows also to um, come up with the formula for the present value um, and we can also price the equity of the firm no, not the shares but here in this case we would take the free cash flows of the company and come up with the present value of the equity as a whole and then you have the fair valuation of the equity and you can simply divide it by the number of shares um, and even though this is very simple um, you can see the idea what investment banks will do they will try to forecast future payments and future cash flows from the company be it in the form of dividends or be it in the form of free cash flows they will try to forecast the cash flows and then if they have such a cash flow uh, prognosis um, they will discount the cash flows and calculate the fair price this is what you will do in uh, firm valuation um, obviously the methods are a little bit more elaborate than these simple examples but th this is the basic idea you will have to forecast cash flows and then come up with a suitable uh, rate of return and discount your cash flows to come up with a fair pricing for the stock or for the total equity of the firm okay now we've seen valuation also as part in ipos uh, we've seen leveraged buyouts um, i've left out mergers and acquisitions in part uh, actually it's very similar to ipos and season offering if you want to buy a company what would you do you would have to make a valuation of the firm if i were to buy tesla i would need to know how much money is tesla really worth so it doesn't make too much of a difference if i wanted to buy the company or whether the company wanted to make an ipo you still need to have an idea of what the company is worth what the value of the firm is and here valuation uh, will be similar for ipos and m&a deals so let's now turn to trading and structuring this is the last main function of investment banking um, that's first of all sales and trading and connected to sales and trading is the structuring or financial engineering of securities 
all three types of business concern security trading on behalf of clients or as part of the bank's proprietary trading. Is the difference clear? In, uh, if you trade on behalf of clients, you are trading for clients on behalf of clients. In proprietary trading, the German word is much more intuitive, Eigenhandel. Then you are trading for yourself as a bank. Well, that's proprietary trading. Sales, sales desk of an investment bank is um, the department that tries to propose ideas for securities transactions to institutional investors and it tries to submit offers. So if a client places an order, um, it will be through the investment bank sales desk. So the sales desk will forward it to the trading desk and then the back office and the middle office will step in and allow and facilitate and manage this trade done by the sales and the trading desks. What's the trading desk, or simply referred to as the front office? Um, that's the part that executes the trading orders. One part of the trading desk, that's the so-called proprietary trading, has no direct contact with clients and carry, carries out uh, those transactions that uh, are done on behalf of or for the account of the investment bank itself. And what they also do, they do not only sell securities like uh, bond securities, uh, bonds or debt instruments and stocks, but they will also sell structured financial products, also called financially engineered products. What are these? Uh, these are financial instruments that consist of one or more underlying securities and usually at least one derivative component. And they enable the investor to buy, sell a desired return risk profile without having to acquire the individual security at full cost. What does it mean? If I wanted to buy an instrument that has such a cash flow, I would not need a financially engineered product. I would simply buy a coupon bond. This is the cash flow of a regular coupon bond with a 5% coupon. Done. If I wanted to buy a stock, I will buy the stock. But if I wanted to buy something that looks like this, I will not find a simple financial instrument with such a cash flow stream. But I can go to an investment bank and I can ask it to offer me a contract which guarantees the exchange of these cash flows. They will probably say, okay, we will not do this for 100, but for a price P and we'll fix this price. And if I accept this price, then I'll enter this contract. And this is a financially engineered product. Why? The investment bank guarantees the cash flow stream to its client, but the investment bank itself will try to construct this by dealing in wholesale in financial derivatives, bonds, stocks, etc., so that in its portfolio, all those different cash flows needed to construct this will cancel itself out and it will make a profit out of the price difference here in contrast to the price of the single instrument needed to construct this cash flow stream. That's financial engineering. And in many cases, this will have to include a financial derivative, otherwise you will not be able to construct this. No? Okay. That's investment banking. Tradings and sales, structuring. Um, this is what investment banks do. Uh, you should have seen, and you have probably seen by now, that investment banking is quite different from commercial banking when it comes to lending and accepting deposits. It's much closer to capital markets and it's almost always concerned about providing institutional investors and uh, corporate customers with access to finance. Access to bond financing, access to equity financing. Hmm? Any questions? Okay. Now let's come to 
the part of this lecture that's uh, actually quite, uh, how should I put it? Um, that's a lot of fun to do in English, uh, I should say so. Uh, it's financial accounting, and I should stress the fact it's uh, financial accounting of banks under German law. Uh, so we'll talk about the German uh, HGB, uh, the German Commercial Code, Deutsche Handelsgesetzbuch, a little bit about IFRS, but uh, mostly about uh, the German Commercial Code and its uh, regulations and uh, provisions for accounting, financial accounting of banks. I start with uh, a short introduction why financial statements are needed. I think that should be clear to every one of you. Uh, stop me if I go uh, through the slides too quickly. Um, the thing to stress here is that German accounting rules uh, and German accountants are actually quite proud of the fact that creditor and customer protection are the prime objectives of financial accounting in Germany. That is quite different when it comes to US GAAP or IFRS. But uh, the, the most dominant and the prime directive of financial accounting rules in Germany is creditor protection. Meaning that uh, the rules and provisions of the German Commercial Code are in many cases much more conservative than the ones that work quite similarly but are slightly different under US GAAP or IFRS. So if, for example, you have an asset, it is priced at 100 under IFRS or US GAAP, we will probably have a lower price under German accounting rules. Why? Because the German, German commercial code says, if in doubt, let's price it at a lower price. So you have a small buffer in case uh, you will need this additional buffer. Yeah? Okay, so... Accounting according to HEV, the German Commercial Code, is meant to protect creditors. Therefore, an annual statement provides the basis for determining a carefully measured distributable profit, and it's overly conservative. The objective of IFRS, in contrast, is to provide market-based information on the company's asset, financial, and earnings situations. Um, and if you're not... Um, if you're not uh, versed in German accounting rules, um, we have the HGB, HGB, Handelsgesetzbuch, the German Commercial Code, that uh, includes regulations for the accounting of all companies and the general rules. There are some industries like banking, like insurance, for which we also have additional special laws. I will show them to you in a moment. But for example, um, for uh, a company that operates shoe stores like the one uh, uh, across the street, only the German Commercial Code is relevant. There are no special laws for retail shops, for example. For banking and insurance, we have some additional laws, but not for retail companies and uh, some other industries, for most other industries, actually. Purpose and functions of financial statements are basically the same for banks as for other companies. They're used to provide information to an external audience. In addition now to the usual stakeholders, we also now have regulators, BaFin and Bundesbank and the European Central Bank as the audience, because obviously they also base some of their regulation uh, on the basis of the general accounting done and the financial statements um, published and disclosed by banks. Now, in the case of banks, the focus is on investors. Providing investors with information reduces existing uncertainties and asymmetric information. And it also helps to assess the conduct of the bank's management. Yeah, that should also be clear. Financial statements are used by shareholders and future investors. Uh, and it is also important that depositors can use financial statements to uh, assess the stability of their bank. Okay. 
So that's quite clear. Um, investors in capital market oriented companies, in contrast to shareholders of a partnership, have to solely rely on annual reports uh, to receive information on the economic situation of the company. Therefore, extensive accounting and disclosure requirements are imposed. And in addition, all banks are required to publish their annual financial statements. So you will find all those statements. Uh, do you know where you can find those in Germany? Um, clearly in specialized vendors. You will find it probably on Bloomberg and Datastream, WorldScope. But where do you find the officially um, published financial statements and annual reports of German companies? No idea. In many cases on the websites of the companies themselves, that's clear, but that's not the official version. The official, officially disclosed and published version is available from the Bundesanzeiger. The That's a good translation for Bundesanzeiger. Uh, the federal Bundesanzeiger. Anzeiger is also usually a name for a newspaper. Yeah? But uh, Bundesanzeiger, that's the official, official uh, publication medium of the federal state, of the federal government. Laws. Uh, and such things are published in the Bundesanzeiger. Okay. And you can also go to the, uh, on the internet to the Bundesanzeiger and retrieve uh, financial statements there. Okay. So these are the general purposes of financial statements for banks. Again, we'll mostly talk about uh, the German commercial code here. Um, some important things to stress when it comes to banks financial statements the balance sheet of a bank contains information about the liquidity and risk situation therefore the assets are structured by decreasing liquidity and the li liabilities by increasing maturity that's a difference to the general layout of a generic company's financial statement under the general commercial code it's different for banks the asset, the structure of the asset side and the liability side is different for banks. So you have a differentiation of debtors between public authorities, banks and consumers. This also provides additional information on the riskiness of certain transactions. On the asset side's, uh, side of the balance sheet, there is a distinction between claims and securities and on the liability side between liabilities and securitized liabilities. Securities, German Wertpapiere, uh, must be internally assigned to one of the following three categories for the purpose of allegation. Financial investments, trading portfolio, or liquidity reserve, meaning that do you want to gamble on them? Are you only keeping them as a liquidity reserve? Or is this a strategic investment? So depending on the question, for which purpose you are keeping and holding stocks and securities, you have to assign those securities to one of those three buckets. For the latter, provision reserves may be created, which allow for a deliberate, deliberate undervaluation. And in the income statement, net interest income and net commission income are shown. And for some item, income and expenses can, and sometimes they cannot be uh, netted and offset. Let's start with the legal basis for the accounting under the German Commercial Code. Uh, banks must file annual statements consisting of a balance sheet, an income statement, uh, and notes, as well as a management report, which must, must be audited and certified by a certified public accountant. In German, that's called a Wirtschaftsprüfer. And you can immediately um, Identify someone as a CPA because you will see a name like and he or she will carry a WP in front of his name for Wirtschaftsprüfer. In Anglo-American countries, you usually have people with a CPA after the name. In German, uh, people will carry 
there are three abbreviations actually. Uh, RA for Rechtsanwalt, lawyer. Uh, SGB, that's a tax accountant, Steuerberater. And you have VP, WP for Wirtschaftsprüfer, certified public accountant. Um, just for those exchange students uh, in Germany, you need, uh, we do not have per se a bar exam. You need to have studied law. Uh, you need to take the university exam, uh, which is called the first state exam. Uh, it's administered and uh, you have to take it with the state, for example, here in the state of Saxony, but it is done at the university. Then you will have to do a clerkship for two years. And after having done a clerkship, uh, for two years with the state, uh, you will have to pass the second state exam, which is equivalent to the bar exam. And then you are, um, you, uh, it's similar to the bar exam, I think, in the state of New York. Uh, if you take the second state exam in any state of Germany, you, you are allowed to uh, apply to become a judge, um, a district attorney or a state attorney, or uh, work as a lawyer. So it doesn't make any difference if you pass the state exam in Saxony or Bavaria or any other state, but you're allowed to operate and work in all of Germany. It's a little bit different in the US. I think if you pass the bar exam in the state of New York, you're allowed to work as a lawyer in all states, but that's not the case in, any, in, in all of the 50 states. So sometimes you're only allowed to work in some states. Um, that's the lawyer, RA Rechtsanwalt, uh, Steuerberater, tax accountant, that's similar to the CPA. It means that you have, uh, you are allowed to advise people on their tax returns. Uh, and that's a job in Germany. And CPA is Wirtschaftsprüfer. And the Wirtschaftsprüfer, that's also, uh, you have to take an exam. Um, after, I, I think you need a couple of years of working experience and then you can take the exam which is extremely hard in Germany. So um, then you are allowed to audit and certify annual statements. So you have the German Commercial Code, the general rules, and you have some special regulations. For example, uh, paragraphs 340 up until 340.0 of the German Commercial Code. Then the Rechnungs Legungskreditverordnung, RechtkretV, die Verordnung über die Rechnungslegung der Kreditinstitute und Finanzdienstleistungsinstitute, translated as the executive, uh, the executive order concerning the accounting of credit institutions and financial services institutions. It's slightly different. I might have explained this to you. Uh, the German Commercial Code is a set of laws. It's a law. Uh, it's a code of law that has been passed by Parliament, uh, whereas the executive order here and a Verordnung is an executive order by um, a ministry or by a federal agency. Okay. And then we have the KWG, Kreditwesengesetz, the German Banking Act, that's again is a law, and you have some regulations regarding the reporting deadlines and auditing. Now, these special regulations only include provisions that deviate from the um, general rules of the German Commercial Code. So um, you might find different provisions in the German Commercial Code, but you need to know that uh, these um, special laws, they supersede the general rules of the German Commercial Code. Okay. Now, what's the structure of the balance sheet under the German Commercial Code? Uh, the formal structure of the balance sheet is regulated in Form 1 of the uh, Rechnungslegungskriegsinstitutverordnung. Uh, a bank's balance sheet deviates from balance sheet of non-banks in the following major ways. The order of the balance sheet items is reversed. I told you that the asset side begins with cash and cash equivalents for all other industries is the other way around. You have uh, buildings, uh, real estate assets, and at the very bottom you have cash. For banks it's different. 
Uh, the liability side starts with outside capital. There is no division of assets into fixed and current assets. Financial assets are divided into numerous balance sheet items, and tangible assets, however, are combined into a single balance sheet position. Why? Because usually banks only own financial securities and financial assets and only few tangible assets. Information on the liquidity situation of a credit institution is provided by the static liquidity, that's the relation between assets and liabilities, and when it comes to dynamic liquidity, the degree of solvency guaranteed by future incoming and outgoing payments. And some balance sheet items are subdivided after term or maturity criteria, and in the notes for the financial statements, receivables and payables are broken down by time to maturity. This is the original form from this executive order in German. I um, thought it, would, doesn't, it doesn't make sense or too much sense to translate it. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is a form template. It's actually quite long and you can see that uh, this is an exhaustive and comprehensive template. Uh, it starts with cash, uh, cash uh, with central banks. On the liability side, you have uh, liabilities uh, with credit institutions, um, and it goes on from there. And this is the general template for a bank's balance sheet. Now. Let's talk about some of these items. Financial assets generally define entitlements to future payments, for example, granting loans, credit, purchasing shares, etc. And the defining characteristic for the allocation to the individual balance sheet items are the possibility for refinancing this with central banks, its marketability, so the ease with which you can sell it and resell it, and the legal status of the holder of the financial instrument. And because of their marketability and ability to refinance, financing instruments possess a high degree of liquidity so that their uh, delimitation from non-tradable financial assets provides information about the liquidity situation of the bank. Now, regarding the legal status, one has to distinguish between share certificates, which securitize ownership and membership rights, and debt instruments, which represent creditor rights. So you will distinguish between equity and debt investments. Now, what type of instruments do we have? We have, in German, these are called Forderungstitel. Those are claims against other parties. Um, those that are refinanced with Central Bank, and you will find it in A2, A like in active or asset 2 here, asset side 2. If it's a claim with a security character, so if it's a security rather than a debt instrument that is refinanced with the central bank, it goes into A5. If you have any other claim against customers or credit institutions, it will go to A3 and A4. And the motivation behind this is quite clear. If it's refinanced with the central bank, that's it. If it's a financial security, uh, well, it should go to A5. And if you have a claim against your customers, that should also be different from a claim against another credit institution, another bank. So you make a distinction between A3 and A4. And this is, these are the first four uh, positions on your balance sheet. Now. How do you do accounting for debt securities? A6, A7, A8. Shares and other non-fixed income securities, investments and holdings. Now, investments are those where you have a permanent connection between the two companies and you have an assumption of participation, shareholdings, um, actually, this is not just debt securities, also equity. You can see shares here. Now, it's an investment in A7 if this 
qualifies as a strategic investment in another company. Then it goes into A7. If it's included in the consolidated financial statement, it goes into A8. And if it's neither a strategic investment and neither a holding and not consolidated, it goes into A6 shares and other non-fixed income securities. Other instruments similar to shares always have to go to A6 and they are not allowed as investments or holdings. Shares of a limited liability corporation uh, of a Gesellschaft mit beschränkter Haftung, GmbH, or partnership, they are not allowed in A6. They always have to go into A7 unless it's A8 as an exception. It can also go to A15. What does this mean? It means that if you own a share, you cannot simply put it under shares in your bank's balance sheet, but you need to make a distinction between shares you hold as a long-term strategic investment, then it would go into investments or holding, or under A6, which is the position for short-term trading investment. Now, under the balance sheet, A6, shares and other non-fixed income securities, all shares falling under the definition of securities are to be disclosed. Equity-like securities, investment shares, warrants, bearer or order papers, other non-fixed income securities, and so far they are listed on the stock exchange. In case assets cannot clearly, clearly be assigned to items A6 to A8, paragraph 271 of the German Commercial Code states that the terms participations and shares in affiliated companies are defined for corporations and they can be used. Then you also have trust assets. Those are assets held by a bank in its own name but on behalf of third parties. Compensation claims against the public sector including bonds from their exchange, A10, contain claims which arose in the course of the currency reform of 1948 as well as claims against the compensation fund currency conversion that arose in the context of the currency conversion at the German reunification. Very special uh, position in the balance sheet. A11, intangible assets, includes acquired concessions, industrial property rights, similar rights and assets as well as licenses in these rights and assets if they are attributable to fixed assets. A11 corresponds to intangible assets in any other non-financial company's balance sheet. And so on and so on. Property, plant and equipment. Pending deposits on the subscribed capital. Own shares or shares. Other assets. Accruals and deferrals. And so on. These are similar to the ones of a non-financial company. And you can only see that, for example, property, plant and equipment will be non-existent to very small in a bank's balance sheet. But it can be included. An amount indicated under deficit not covered by equity means over indebtedness or insolvency. This item is not an asset, but it's a residual item in case the balance sheet doesn't balance out. No? Then in this case, uh, you will have a loss. Okay. Now let's look at the liability side. Liabilities are more important for banks than for non banks because you have much more sources of capital. You have equity, you have profits, you have uh, reserves, you have depositors, you have uh, uh, bond investors, etc. And the items are partially subdivided in the same way as the corresponding items on the asset side, meaning that you have a breakdown of receivables and you have a distinction between cust liabilities to customers and liabilities to banks with the same maturity structure. And you can see this in P1, P2, and P3. P for passive, German word for the liability side. You start with securitized liabilities. They may not be registered securities, must be securitized and must be transferable. Then you have trustee liabilities. Uh, those are the counterparts to trust assets. Then 
Other liabilities includes all liabilities which cannot be assigned to any other balance sheet items. You again have accruals and deferrals. Then you have provisions. Those are used by both banks and non-banks to capture uncertain obligations. And here you have which provisions. And these are quite important for banks. Any idea? LLP, what, was, what does LLP stand for? Loan loss provisions. If you have loans that are underperforming, or if you have loans that are probably not be, that will probably not be repaid in full, you will have to form loan loss provisions on your liability side meaning that those are potential future losses. And you have to depreciate your position on the asset side because if you have given out 100 euros in loans and you only expect 50 to be repaid, you need to depreciate um, your position on your asset side and you will form loan loss provisions as... Um, provision for this, you know, for anticipated losses from pending transactions, usually loans, you know, but also, of course, for derivative instruments. Then you also have special reserves and some other things, subordinated liabilities, participation rights, capital, Genussrechtskapital, fund for general banking risks, and so on. And then you have equity capital. You have gezeichnetes Kapital, uh, capital reserves, retained earnings, and a balance sheet profit or balance sheet loss. This is actually not a very good name, but a common equity. Now, um, when it comes to equity, um, the, the structure and the definitions of the parts of equity do not differ too much from those uh, found for general industrial firms, but uh, if you take a look at a balance sheet of a given bank, you will see that the equity ratio will be much lower for a bank than for um, an industrial company. Now, there are also so-called items below the balance sheet line. Angaben uh, unter der Bilanz. That is, transactions that may result in liability or credit risk for the bank. Those are reported in the items below the balance sheet line. And these incidents are to be reported if a claim is possible. If a claim is expected, uh, you need to form a provision for anticipated losses from pending transactions. But if it's only probable uh, and possible, it should not be included in the balance sheet, but it has to be reported below the balance sheet. And the formation of these provisions represents an expense, the disclosure below the balance sheet line does not affect the net income. Do you see the difference? If you expect it to happen with a certain probability, you need to include it, and it will be relevant for your income. If you think it could be possible that Martians attack and my loans will not be repaid, then you can include this below the balance sheet line as a possibility but you will not form a provision against this. Okay. Then you have contingent claims, Haftungsverbindlichkeiten, which may arise in the future. Other obligations, they include irrevocable loan commitments, which justify credit risk. Okay. Now, valuation of assets and liabilities. You've seen the general structure of the asset and liability side. Uh, if you had to form such a balance sheet, you would probably more or less know where to insert those assets and liabilities. The question now is, how do you value assets and liabilities? Basic evaluation problem is uh, you first have to stick to the general rules. Um, then you will see that for banks, you have some special provisions in the German Commercial Code. Those are 340E to 340H 
the German commercial code until or unless the special valuation rules state otherwise. The general rules apply 279 to 283 and unless otherwise specified also 252 to 256 apply. What are the principles you need to adhere to? The principle of prudence, realization principle. Gains may not be recognized in profit or loss until they have been realized. And in parity principle, potential losses must be taken into account by setting up provisions or making extraordinary depreciations. For assets, the lowest value principle applies. For the liabilities, the nominal value principle applies. Nominalwertprinzip und Niederstwertprinzip. What does this mean? Why, to, why are you required to take the nominal values for liabilities? Because that's the maximum you will have to pay. If you have received 100 euros as a nominal, as a notional value of a bond or a loan, you will never pay back 110 notional. You will only pay back the nominal value of your loan, with interest, of course, but only 100. The market value of this loan will be lower or equal to 100, but you will never pay back more money than you have uh, lent. When it comes to assets, however, what do you take? You take the lowest probable value this asset will probably have, and you will have to stick to the lowest probable value. If you've bought it for 100, but currently it's only worth 50, you will use 50 in your accounting and you will not be allowed to use 100. Why? What is the idea here? If you assume you take a loan of 100, you buy an asset, for 100 and have a balance sheet of 100, 100. That's okay. If you think there is a possibility that the price could only be 50, and if you were only to resell it at 50, then German accounting rules immediately force you to show a loss of 50 euros. If this loss is realized, that's a totally different question, but then the surprise will be positive and investors will see, oh, the loss wasn't as bad as we thought. But accounting rules state that you have to take the lowest value and you will have to report a loss immediately. Okay. Now, this, we have a distinction between a strict application and a moderate application of the lowest value principle. Strenges und What's the German name? Does anyone know? Uh, strenges Niederswertprinzip and gelockertes oder gemildertes. Yeah. Gemildertes Niederswertprinzip, genau. And it depends on whether the asset belongs to fixed or current assets. And this subdivision, this subdivision is missing from the bank balance sheet. And we have a special legal provision that's 340E, section 1 of the German Commercial Code. The strict application applies to A2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 15, and the moderate application applies to 7, 8, 11, and 12. What is the difference? Generally, the idea is that in the strict application, it means if there is any indication of even a temporary loss in value, you need to take the lowest value. The moderate application, gemildertes Niederswertprinzip, states that if you think the loss is only transit, transient and transitory, you can still keep the original value. You only need to go for the lower value of an asset if you have to expect that this depreciation is not just temporary but permanent. You know? If we have financial assets that are treated like fixed assets. We have the moderate application of the lowest value principle. That is, the write-downs, 
the depreciation write-offs and write-downs only appear and only happen in case of a permanent value impairment. And we have a write-down option in the event of a temporary impairment. For the trading portfolio and the liquidity reserve, for those stocks and instruments held for trading and as a liquidity reserve, we have the strict application of the lowest value principle, meaning that we have an obligation to write offs in the event of just a temporary impairment and, of course, if you have expected fluctuations in value. Difference clear? Now, for those long-term assets, you can argue that, okay, I think this impairment is only temporary. You can still keep the original value. But as soon as you're in the trading portfolio or the liquidity reserve, you have to uh, write off um, the values um, immediately. Here's some discretionary powers in the allocation to the three categories of securities. Now, you have the first level. For financial assets, you have the moderate application of the lowest value principle. For the trading portfolio and the liquidity reserve, you have the strict application. At the second level, you have discretionary powers in the use of the valuation options within each security category. You have the write-down option in the event of a temporary impairment for the trading, uh, no, for the financial assets. You have the write-down option for expected fluctuations in value in the trading portfolio and the write-down option for expected fluctuations for the liquidity reserve. And you have some discretion powers in assessing uh, facts that are relevant to valuation. Uh, now, is the reduction value temporary? Are there any future impairments to expect? And if yes, of what size are they? And the same for the liquidity reserves. Okay. So that's the valuation. Um, sometimes uh, loans are granted or acquired with a agio or disagio. That is, the payment amount or purchase price does not correspond to the total nominal amount. And in contrast to non-banks, banks can account for loans at nominal amount as long as receivables are not included in the trading portfolio. And this disagio has to be included in the accruals and defer deferrals on the liability side and has to be amortized on a scheduled basis in the following year. And this is the valuation of claims. Um, when calculating the carrying amount, one has to be uh, to determine whether the carrying amount of the previous period is appropriate, considering the current credit worthiness of the debtor. In case of recognizable default risks or country risks, uh, an individual value adjustment is made. And in case of latent risk, which are not yet obvious, a flat rate value adjustment is made. And for risk prevention, risk reserves can be formed. So you have uh, loan loss reserves or risk reserves. This is actually found quite often in also in uh, US accounting for banks, loan loss reserves. You make reserves for expected average losses on your credit portfolio. You do not know that, for example, this or that credit uh, loan will be impaired. Then you would have to do a loan loss provision, but you form loan loss reserves because you know for each million in loans, you probably lose 50,000. Then you have loan loss reserves. Okay, how does it work? You have the nominal receivable amount minus the expected repayments by the borrower, minus the expected proceeds from the realization of collateral, and then you have the amount of individual value adjustment. And this is a general provision for doubtful debts. That's the default ratio times the risky credit volume. And what can be done here as part of the uh, individual valuation allowance, the so-called Einzelwertberichtigung, uh, you take the default ratio, that's the average uh, bad debt loss minus um, either the Einzelwertberichtigung or 40% times the average of the bad debts loss over the average risky credit volume. And then you know how to more or less correct or make an adjustment uh, for your loan loss reserves uh, on the basis of your full credit portfolio. 
Okay. I think I'll stop here because here we'll talk about the accounting and valuation of derivatives. There's a typo here um, of derivatives. Um, derivatives accounting is very important for banks, obviously, because those are highly risky instruments. Um, you need to account uh, for the riskiness of these positions. Uh, and there are major differences between US GAAP and IFRS and the German commercial code when it comes to hedge accounting. Why? Uh, quite simple. Uh, does anyone know one of the major differences between US GAAP and IFRS? What is hedge accounting? What does it mean, hedge accounting? Hedge accounting means that uh, you, <laughs> pardon the uh, wordplay, you account for the fact that you have a position and a hedge instrument. And hedge accounting now is a set of rules that states how you have to include and how you can net and offset the position and its corresponding hedging position, stock and option. It could be that you have a stock investment and you have a perfect hedge with a derivative, with an option contract, and the risk of the combined position is exactly zero. Why? Because you win one euro with a stock and you lose one euro with the option and vice versa. Now, do you know the difference between, or one of the differences between US GAAP and IFRS? Under US GAAP, netting and offsetting is allowed, meaning that uh, you have, say, this set of positions and this set of hedge instruments, and the netted position will be this small. Under IFRS, you have to include all positions that are being hedged and all those hedging instruments. The result is that, for example, Deutsche Bank has a balance sheet of, with total assets of close to, or used to have close to 2 billion euros under IFRS and only 1 billion under US GAAP. And you can see the importance of uh, derivative instruments for Deutsche Bank, it's almost half of its balance sheet. Uh, and it makes a huge difference in size, at least, uh, under US GAAP and IFRS because of netting and offsetting rules in hedge accounting. And we'll talk about the German commercial code regulations here for derivatives accounting next week. Do you have any questions? No? Okay, thank you. And see you next week. Thanks. <laughs>